Hi, folks. Uh, oh, I'm going to stand here. Um, wow, a lot more of you turned up. When I came in, the hall was empty. So, um, delight to be here. Uh, I want to um, talk a little bit about um, some of the work that we've been doing around wasps. Um, you, what my lab is trying to do is, is um, use insect genetics to answer a whole bunch of different problems, some of them associated with bees with some of them not. And you'll have seen Goethe hopefully talk about uh, our genetics work um, earlier in the conference, and I hope somebody's going to talk about our work uh, that we're working with Cyan on um, giant willow aphids. But um, one of the issues that I think has come up quite recently is how are we going to control pests in New Zealand given that we have loads of invasive species? And you'll have seen the government announce its 2050 predator free program, with which wasps unfortunately aren't one of the predators they're targeting, but actually wasps turn out to be a really interesting system for us to try and develop some of the new technologies that are being talked about. Now, I want to introduce some, one of those technologies because it's been talked about in the media um, quite a lot as a way that we're going to control pests in New Zealand. And I wanted to kind of put a bit of reality into that discussion, but also talk perhaps a little bit about what the opportunities are. I'm going to use wasps as an example, but we could equally be talking about varroa mite, um, which I think would be a fantastic target for this kind of work. So let's start by talking about wasps. Ooh. If I press that button, something happens. Good. OK, so um, wasps are horrible. And um, there's some numbers up there that says that actually uh, wasps uh, have the highest recorded density in, in honeydew forests. There's actually more biomass of wasps than there are of birds, rodents, and stoats. Right. So there's a hell of a lot of wasps out there. Um, they cost uh, lots of money, and they're one of the top 100 world's most invasive alien species. It's a pretty cool record, right? You know, I'd always wanted to be one of the world's uh, worst invasive species, but didn't manage it. Actually, humans aren't on that list, which is a bit surprising. But to, to beekeepers, um, uh, wasps are an issue. So there's still reasonable numbers of colony losses caused by wasps, and so wasps are an issue for the industry. And of course, wasp control is an issue for the industry because many of the ways that we might control wasps will probably impact on bees as well. So we've got this issue that, that actually we need to get rid of wasps, but they're you know, infinitesimally evolutionarily diverged um, from from bees, that's not actually true, they're about 100 million years diverged. So what, what, when we talk about controlling insects, what opportunities, what, what technologies do we have? And I want to talk very briefly about some of these before going on to the last and most um, frightening one. So uh, obviously solutions for insects include things like insecticides, um, and those of you who have been using Vespex will know that it's a really fantastic way of controlling wasps. It's also very expensive and there's no way that we're going to deploy that in the vast areas of the South Island which are really uh, infested with these boys. Um, there are biocontrol opportunities for wasps. A tiny little parasitic wasp has been introduced in New Zealand to control wasps. It seems to have come to New Zealand and had a sleep and doesn't seem very effective. The Biological Heritage National Science Challenge, which is a, a, a government-funded uh, research consortium, uh, is developing RNA interference, uh, which is a technology I don't want to talk about. We're actually doing the development of RNA interference. It's a way of, collect, of, of killing um, pest insects, but it's not... Um, it's not really much more effective than, than an insecticide. And there's also technologies talked about called Trojan female systems, okay, which um, are great but would involve the release of hundreds of thousands of wasps to kill the ones we already have, which seems counterintuitive. The, the final solution is a thing called gene drives, which you might see in the media as um, being something that people care about. And um, perhaps the best quote I've heard is this guy, Emeritus Professor Sir Alan Mark, who says, the gene drive proposal provides the greatest hope for turning back the relentless and developing tide of invasive mammalian pests in New Zealand. And let's delete the word mammalian because we don't care about mammals. Um, what we care about here are, are wasps. The only way uh, Alan thinks of us getting rid of our wasp problem in New Zealand is by using a gene drive kind of approach. So we've been looking into this process in kind of two ways. Firstly, looking at what evidence there are that gene drives might be effective, and then thinking about how we might develop one and how that might be deployed in New Zealand. So I want to talk a little bit about the gene drive um, technology uh, to get us started. So the gene drives were first proposed by a guy. Well, it's not true, actually. I've discovered somebody else proposed it. So first dot item on the slide is a lie. Uh, but Austin Burt popularized the idea of gene drives in about 2003. And the idea here is that what you can do is use a genetic trick to push a gene through a population. So um, the idea, let's just skip the words and look at the diagram. So if you were to take, here we have an example of a genetically modified um, insect, which is the green one, and we're crossing it with a non-genetically modified insect. Okay, and if we do that, what, what's going to happen is all the offspring of that are going to carry one copy of that genetically modified um, DNA, right? Because all of these things are diploid, they're receiving one copy of their genome from their mother, one copy from their father, okay? So they're what we call heterozygous. 
If we cross those um, again with a wild type individual, then you're going to get 50% of the population are going to be genetically modified and 50% aren't. So if we were to have that, instead of that green glowing insect, actually to have some sort of defect in its biology, which means that it dies or it's uh, sterile, then you can see that using this kind of approach, they're rapidly going to die out in the population, and so you will have at least a genetically modified insect, which has no effect. So the trick is to mess with the genetic system here and find a way such that when you do that second cross of your genetically modified insect, every one of the offspring carries that modification. Okay? And we can do this uh, using technology that was, as I said, really discovered in 2003 and has been um, developed now to the point where it's actually effective. In 2003, uh, this was regarded as a way to kill malaria-carrying mosquitoes. In 2003, malaria was still the biggest killer of uh, humans, and so malaria was seen as a it's still a reasonably good target. So the idea here is that during the development, is there a zappy thing? Oh, let's do it with a thingy. Here we go. So during the development um, of your, there we go, mosquito, you know that you're going to produce um, offspring mosquito and that this, they, their chromosomes are going to go through meiosis. If those chromosomes have one copy of that gene because they received one from their mother, and not one from their father, then as I said, in the next generation, you're going to get 50% with your modified 50% that aren't. So what was it proposed as a technology which would cause this copy of the gene to be copied onto the other chromosome so that every offspring inherited that modification. All right? um, and it's sort of a co copy and paste uh, method. And in the last few years, a technology called CRISPR has been developed which enables us to do this very effectively. And I don't want to go into huge amounts of detail, but if we were to take these two bits of DNA. So here we have those two chromosomes, right? one from the mother and one from the father. One of them is genetically modified and one of them has a has, is at a particular site. So in that recognition site in the normal chromosome, we've shoved in this piece of DNA, which contains an enzyme which cuts DNA, a way of driving that piece of DNA to the recognition site, and that green fluorescent protein which makes those insects green. What happens is that if this construct is present in the chromosome, it will produce the thing which cuts DNA, and the guide, which will cut that empty recognition site. And when that happens, organisms respond by copying the piece of DNA from the other chromosome. So when that piece of DNA is copied, it'll say, oh, look, where do I find a piece of DNA that's similar? Well, there's one right here. And so we'll copy that whole construct with that targeting enzyme right into that um, sequence. So that means that converts that empty allele into one which now carries that construct. And so very easily, we can end up in the situation where all the offspring of that cross carry that modified gene. If we link that modified gene, or instead of a, a protein which makes that fly, or that moth in this case, green, we turn that into something which actually affects the biology of that organism, you can very easily see that we can drive that deleterious effect through a population and perhaps collapse a population. So these technologies called CRISPR-Cas, uh, a CRISPR-Cas gene drive, I'm calling them Cas9 gene drives, these technologies have been produced in two insect species, all right? Those two insect species are one, the Drosophila melanogaster, the vinegar fly, geneticist's favorite fly, and also in two species of Anopheline mosquitoes. Okay, so mosquitoes which carry malaria or other human diseases. Despite uh, common belief, these technologies have not been used outside the lab. They have not been released into the wild. There are insect control programs which look a bit like this, but they're not gene drives. Um, and all of these technologies have problems, right? They don't actually work very well even in the laboratory. So when people talk about, uh, can we use this technology to control our pests, wasps, possums, stoats, the problem is actually the technology doesn't work very well in the lab and needs a huge amount of modification and a huge amount of work to get it to work in a wild situation. So if we wanted to do this, what would we need to do? Well, if we want to make a gene drive system, first of all, we have to make transgenic organisms. To make transgenic insects is pretty easy when you're talking about a fruit fly or when you're talking about a mosquito, but actually nobody's made a transgenic wasp before. They have made transgenic bees, so it might be possible, but there's a lot of work to be done in basic biology to make insects that are genetically modified. We also need to understand how we might affect the fertility or the fecundity of that, organization, of that organism, right? So it's no good just pushing a green fluorescent protein through this population, you want to do something which actually kills the wasps. And it's not clear what that target would be in any organism, despite those ones that we've studied uh, very strongly. 
we need to have DNA sequence of those organisms, right? So we need to sequence the genomes of the pests that we're actually targeting. And finally, we need some understanding of the population structure of these organisms, because resistance arises if there's genetic variation. That's a huge advantage for us when we're targeting invasive species, because they're probably very genetically similar. But actually, we need to know that before we start releasing genetically modified organisms. And of course, the most important issue is you guys. Right? Gene drives are not possible, despite what anyone will tell you in the media. They're not possible without releasing a genetically modified organism. All right? And of course, public opinion is a massive feature in deploying something like a gene drive. And so there needs to be a great deal of public consultation before we can move ahead towards saying, can we develop these things and are these going to be effective? And given that the technology exists only in laboratories and doesn't actually work very well, there's a lot of work to be done to actually just be able to demonstrate to the public that this is a safe technology and a technology that's effective. All right. All of that being said, I kind of agree with Alan Mark that we don't actually have many other options. And one of the best targets for us to aim for would be something like the wasp, which we know is genetically depauperate in New Zealand and enormously invasive. If you ask me to genetically modify a wasp and develop a gene drive system, I think it would take me five to 10 years. If you ask me to genetically modify a stoat and make a gene drive system, I think I'll be dead before I achieved it, right? You know, and nobody wants to play with stoat reproduction. Uh, so in terms of the, both the science and the public support, we are a long way from deploying a gene drive, but that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you about this technology, because actually people need to know what the technology is, how it works, and what the opportunities are, because we need to have a mature discussion about the, the, the possibilities and the risks of this kind of work. So could we develop a gene drive system for wasps? All right, this would be... Three minutes, two minutes, oh, of course, well, five minutes. Oh, it's just too confusing, man. <laughs> um, it's around near the end, surprisingly. Um, so could we develop a gene drive system to wasps? Well, firstly, we need some things. We need a genome sequence of the common and German wasps. Phil Lester and I at, from Victoria University, we are doing such a thing at this very moment. Actually, I'm here talking to you, but um, hopefully somebody's doing the sequencing. We need a method of transforming wasps, which means that somebody gives me, needs to give me permission to make transgenic wasps in New Zealand in containment. We need to know something about the biology of wasps so that we can pick particular parts of the genome that we might target with the gene drive system. And we need to talk to the public about whether they're going to accept the release of genetically modified organisms. And if I said to you, look, I can release, if I released 20,000 genetically modified wasps and that knocked down the wasp population 20%, I suspect you'd be unhappy with that and say, no, Peter, we don't wish you to do that. But if I said to you, I'm going to release three wasps and it's going to wipe out wasps permanently from New Zealand, you might be more keen on it. So we actually have to develop these systems and work out the parameters in containment of how they work, what, how safe they are, whether they're safe, whether they're going to jump species, what their effects are going to be, before we can actually even come to the public and say, look, here are the options. So in summary, ooh, gene drives look good, but we're a very long way from implementing them. Do not think that we can relax on the Vespex at this point in time. We need to kill wasps, and we need to use the tools that we have available. In 10 years, we might be able to find other solutions. There's a huge amount of fundamental biology that needs to be thought about before we can start using gene drives. Now, in wasps, there is nobody but Phil Lester and I working on that bio. Oh, there's a few more starting to work on, on wasps. But basic biology is very difficult to fund in the New Zealand system on systems like wasps. If you were to ask us to do the same thing in stoats, there is basically no work understanding reproductive biology in stoats that we would need to, 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 to know to deploy these kinds of systems. Actually, we need fundamental research to understand how these pests work. Wasps are a good candidate because of possible social acceptance, good knowledge from nearby species, but we need to get some knowledge about how these work before we blithely throw them around as solutions to these problems. So it looks promising, but at this point, there's no silver bullet. I'd like to thank lots of people. Um, this is, uh, this um, picture is, uh, epitomizes my lab, where we think bees and wasps should live in harmony. Though actually, what we want is a solution in that honey that kills the wasp and improves the health of the bee. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, Andrew, Charlotte, uh, Tom, Gemma, Monica Gruber, uh, Hamish Spencer, and Phil Lester, all people who are involved in this kind of projects, and all the funders, uh, Bioprotection, Ministry of Primary Industries, Ministry of Business, Innovation, and Employment, the Bioprotection uh, Research Center, the Bioheritage National Science Challenge, Gravita, and the University of Otago, and all of those people, whether you know it or not, uh, all you, uh, because they're funded by the government, and so pay more tax, and we'll do something about your wasps. Thank you very much.
ha happy to have questions, or you can find me after this afternoon. Oh, look, there's a question. Although I appreciate that wasps are a nuisance, in countries where they originated, they're an important part of the ecosystem. And we know that things come blowing over or get, you know, migrated with our luggage or whatever. So if you're taking your GM modified wasp and they go back to Europe where they originate and are important to, you know, get rid of carcasses in the forest, whatever, um, the wasps in Germany, which are probably not the German wasps, would die out. That's right, absolutely. So, no, I mean, this is a very important point, and I think it applies particularly to things like wasps, less of a problem with something like a possum, right? Uh, but wasps got here on their own, or through um, movement by, uh, unintentional movement by humans. There's no reason to think that if we made a genetically modified wasp that killed our wasps, that it wouldn't get back to its host source. There's a problem we need to solve, right? And there are a couple of hypothetical ways of solving that problem, one of which is that we have a two-gene drive system, one which you then release, which cures the, gene, the first gene drive, which kills the wasps. It's not an ideal thing, so, you know, it's sort of fighting fire with genetic modification. Um, the other is actually, I think, a much more sensible one, and, and one of the reasons why I think New Zealand is a really good place to think about these technologies. Wasps came into New Zealand uh, from a point source, so probably a very small population, and so there isn't the huge genetic diversity that we see in its host range, in, in its home range in Europe, which means that we could target variants that are uncommon in Europe but common in New Zealand. So there are ways that we could ensure that actually, even if one of our wasps got to Europe, it would have a minimal effect. But that, again, that's one of the critical problems that we need to, to address. Oh, okay. Yeah, Peter, uh, just one question. Um, thinking about safety around gene drives, and, okay, you use wasps as an example. Maybe, say, take Varroa as an example, if we did a gene drive on yep. that. Varroa would be awesome. It'd be awesome, yeah. Wouldn't you, say you made a genetically modified Varroa, and the... Reco the genes that are modified within that, if they could be transferred to a virus within the brow, could, could we end up with a, a worse deformed wing virus, for example? Yeah, it, it's an important question. Um, so lots of people have sequenced, so there's two, there's, there's, the, there's the don't worry, I know what I'm doing answer to that question. We sequence the genomes of lots of things and we've never found vast quantities of Varroa DNA in a, in a um, bee. Right, the same would apply to humans, right? You know, no matter how many potatoes you eat, nobody has found any potato genes inserted in the human genome. So those kind of transfers don't occur very frequently, but they do occur with viruses. And a recent paper suggests that actually horizontal transmission, which is the process of bits of DNA moving between species in insects, is more common than it, than it is in mammals. So we, it's another thing that needs to be addressed and very carefully to work out whether there is any um, issue around that kind of safety. And that has to be done, I think, in containment with, with populations you know, being held within laboratories doing these gene drive systems so we can see actually is there any evidence of them leaking. But it is an important point. But it, it's unlikely but worth investigating.